Hello and welcome to another edition of the Curtis and Holly Show. This is the first edition, actually, of the Curtis and Holly Show. Uh, and this is going to be a weekly feature, even though Holly didn't realize it, where Holly is going to be interviewing various different people um, on her own, sometimes with me, but generally with me. And she's not going to stab anybody while she's doing it. And uh, it's going to be a fun time for all. So we decided that Holly's first episode is that she's going to be interviewing me for to ask me all the personal and deep questions that everybody wants to know about, and especially Holly. She's going to be talking about politics, obviously. She's going to be talking about religion. She's going to be talking about all, all the hot topics. And with that, I give you over to Holly. Thank you for that wonderful introduction You're and welcome. for, you know, telling me what I'm doing for the next goodness knows however many years. Appreciate yes. that. <laughs> You're very welcome. Great. Oh, well, I think we might as well start off with my first. I'm going to put the scissors down and keep holding them. Um, <laughs> uh, my first question is, what is your favourite cheese? Because you didn't answer it on Messenger. So. Oh, that's actually a really hard question, but I think I'm going to go uh, with Pepper Jack. Interesting. That's. I don't know what I was expecting, but it wasn't that. Well, okay. What's your favourite cheese, Ollie? Probably Brie. Brie? Brie's good. Cool. cool. Very cool. Um, I should probably ask you a proper question. Um, sure. I'm interested to know what did you do before you? I might have asked you this, but I don't can't remember exactly how much detail we went into. So, like, what did you actually do before music PR? I did a lot of things. Um, I think right before C squared, if I'm not mistaken, was I did sales. Um, and then prior to that, believe it or not, for most of my life, well, not most of my life, but for a lot of my life, I did either retail or worked in a kitchen. Oh. Yeah. Nothing to do with publicity, nothing to do with PR, nothing to do with marketing. And uh, yeah, that's what I, that's what I mainly did. Have you like always been into metal then? Or was that yep. kind of, a, yeah. Yep. Uh, first thing I got was when I was seven years old, I think it was. To Hell with the Devil by Striper. Mm. And then the second one I got after that was another, I think it was another Christian metal band. I think it was uh, Burn This Record by The Lead, if I'm not mistaken. And I've interviewed both those individuals now for a separate podcast. Oh, nice. Yeah. Were they, uh, did they live up to your expectations? Uh, well, I've talked to Michael Sweet twice did one with Corey, and then i did another one on my older podcast uh, michael's really really good to interview he's always got something good to say um just he's always got something controversial to say just like all the time <laughs> he's one of the best people to get a soundbite from and he's he's extremely talkative so yes definitely lived up to my expectations but he's a great interview i would like to have him back again and uh, Julio from The Lead was also uh, lived up to my expectation. Very friendly guy. I met him on Twitter, I think it was two or three years ago. Uh, did a little bit of PR for him. And then I think we're planning on doing some more for him in the future. And you're going to help. Oh, nice. So have you, mm, I can't remember, I don't know if you even told me where you used to live before where you are now. Because what's the, um, I don't really know what the live scene's like, so I'm kind of interested to know if you have any experience. Um, in Cambridge, there's like basically nothing. Uh, um, okay. I don't know what you know about Canada, but um, I'm about an hour and a half outside of Toronto. Um, I don't drive, so you'd have to take a bus if I wanted to go any shows. But the problem is the buses don't go too late. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's like virtually nothing in Cambridge for shows. We have a large population because we're considered to be a, a tri-city. We had about 500, I think it's 500,000 people, 300,000 people in the entire area, but there's like no shows ever come here. I think the last thing that came here was Black Dahlia Murder in 2018 or something like that. So not really much to speak of here, but there's a lot of musicians that live here, lots. I mean, that just seems really strange. I mean, like, do, is it that there aren't any venues there or is it just that everyone goes to Toronto because it's the next city up? Sort of I thing? would imagine that would be the thing because Toronto is the biggest city in Canada, third biggest. Yeah. In the so it's, I think, it's third after Los Angeles and New York. So if you're going to make a stop anywhere, it's going to be Toronto. Oh, wow. okay. You're not going to want to go to uh, 
Cambridge. There's uh, six, seven million people, I think, in Toronto. Seven or eight. I can't remember the exact number, but it's big. It's big. Not London big, but it's pretty damn big. I think that might, yeah, that might be similar to Manchester, although I can't remember exactly. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so what was the best gig that you've ever been to? The best gig? Oh, that's a good question. But I'm going to answer with something that's probably not expected, which is um, I saw Mitochondrion with Tyrant's Blood, and I think it was uh, Dire Omen back in 2012 in Vancouver. Hmm. You're like, I've never heard of any of those guys. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I know, you can always tell with me. I make it obvious. Yeah, but there was good. <laughs> Uh, there are three death metal bands. Tyrant's Blood, I actually ended up working with as one of my first clients later. Um, oh. We did, uh, I think it was two of their albums, if I'm not mistaken. One on Tridroid Records. No, just one. One on Tridroid Records back when that label first started back in 2013. Hmm. So, oh, I might as well ask you about PR stuff then. What was it like when you were first getting into it? Because it's kind of... I don't know, had you already got, I mean, you said you used to do journalism. So did you sort of have some contacts existing or were you trying to sort of build up? No, I did it all by fluke. Everything was by fluke. Yeah. <clears throat> Everything I've ever done has always been by fluke, um, like totally fluke. So basically with uh, how I started to do her PR, actually before how I got into PR is I was writing for a site and the site was uh, owned by a guy who I didn't know at the time did PR. Okay. So yeah, so he was doing PR, and then somehow uh, he asked me if I was willing to help with a campaign, paid. So I said, okay. I got paid $100 to do it, and then I offered to do for free another band, and then it just kept kind of going like that, and then I ended up getting hired by someone to work with them to do PR, kind of like what you, we did with you. And then that person was a total fucking flake, like just a complete fuck, fucking flake, just complete utter flake. So I just was like, okay, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to go do my own thing. And I just kept doing it. Total fluke. Oh. <laughs> 100%. Nice. Yeah, I always find that interesting because there's it's like people are trying to get into the industry and they sort of ask, oh, how do you do it? How do you do it? And it's like, oh, just yeah. fluke. Yeah, like <laughs> I, mean, I feel like that was E-squared, so... You, you were 100% the exact same way, except mine was a little bit different. No, actually, I did kind of a similar thing, actually. I was talking to someone on Twitter who I had no idea had anything to do with PR. I had literally no idea. And I got this random message from his wife who owned the PR company. And I didn't know that they were even connected in any way, shape or form saying, hey, you want to do PR for us? I was like, sure. That was just how it went. And then it was just like, yeah. it ended up being a stupid situation. I got out of it within about seven months. And um, after that, well, it's funny because they were, I shouldn't be bad. I'm not going to bad mouth anymore. I'm not going to bad mouth. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you after the call, if you want to know the details, I'm not going to bad yeah. mouth anymore. That's for the best. Don't want to offend yeah. anyone. Yeah. Mm. But I will say one thing. I'm still doing PR and they're not. maybe they didn't they didn't have the flukes you have i don't know well i don't know i mean it's not really necessarily even flukes it's more like what's the right word it's being in the right place at the right time so mm -hmm. if you can be, put yourself in the right place at the right time uh you can basically make it happen cool do you feel that's kind of happening with c squared a bit or uh, define what you mean um because I mean, I feel as though it kind of, it, I mean, it built up fairly quickly in terms of you like taking this all on. Um, yep. But I feel as though we've got quite a few clients in quite a short space of time as well. Yeah, but keep in mind, I've been doing this for eight years. Well, yeah, true. Because I had, uh, when we started C Squared, um, I didn't change the name officially till June 2nd, I think it was, or June 1st, I can't remember. But prior to that, you guys had already come on. We were calling ourselves C Squared, but it was still under Doer PR. Um, I already had existing clients, um, been established for a, a fairly long time. So I think a lot of the business that we first got at C Squared 
you got to keep in mind was funneled through doer PR mm -hmm. and I transferred it over into C square. So I, I, I don't know if you realize this or not, but I took a big income cut by doing that because now I got you guys over there. Uh, okay. Right. Cause I'm going on the basis mm -hmm. that will work out long-term for everyone involved. So anything I got from doer PR uh, went over to C squared. And then once we change the name, that's how it goes. And for anybody who's listening, how it works with C squared is that there's three publicists that are working it, or there's two at any given time. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I, I'm gonna think how I phrase this. Are you finding the workload kind of easier because it's split between us a bit more or? Um, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Yeah. Because here's the thing is that um, I'm not used to having four people working with me all the time. So as, as you know, sometimes I'll forget to delegate things. So I'm usually pretty good with that, but sometimes I'll forget. Like yesterday, the other day, I realized that I probably did work for you, Gaia and Corey that I didn't need to get done. Uh, so I was, I was yeah. doing all this stuff. And at the end of the day, I, was, I, had, I still had stuff left to do. And I was like, how did I end up getting so backed up? And then I realized I had done stuff that probably should have gone to you, Guy, and Corey. And I wasn't even thinking about it. I just did it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So not like being a dick or anything. I just like I legitimately wasn't thinking about it. And I just went and did it. So sometimes things can be easier. But then sometimes when I forget and I just go and do something. Not always. Yeah. I mean, it kind of makes sense when you've been doing it by yourself for so yeah. long. So. Yeah. Exactly. But when what well, when when we properly delegate things yes but then again the odd day like i said when that happens no nope. it all depends yeah. it all depends oh okay let me think next question sure how has i mean i kind of know the answer to this but i'm going to ask you anyway how's sure. the response to the podcast been it has been absolutely excellent. We have managed to, again, this is a complete fluke out. We've been able to get pretty much anybody we've ever wanted to get on the podcast so far. The only turn down we've had is for Cannibal Corpse. Uh, other than that, uh, we've had a 100% response for like, we'll come on the show. So like we got uh, Michael Sweet within the first week from Striper, like I mentioned. Um, usually he doesn't do small podcasts. And then we got Trevor Stranad from Black Dahlia within a week. Uh, who else did we have? We've had a lot of people from Decibel Magazine on. We've had uh, Ian Blurton on. I mean, we had Lindsay on within a few days, but that, I mean, I, I knew her already, so that was kind of fun to try to do. So, but anyway, it, it's been pretty easy to get guests on. So, and I think that's just due to the fact that I had an older podcast, partly, and also because I've been around for like eight years. So I just basically went to the people that I knew I could probably get, and I asked them first. And then so that kind of helped snowball it because like, for example, we asked Blasco, who plays with Ozzy, to come on the podcast. He was on my older podcast. Plus, right. I talked to him sometimes on Twitter. So that enabled me. So we got him on. And so we were able to say, well, we got Blasco on to other people. Can we get Michael Sweet? And then we got Michael Sweet. So we were able to say, Trevor, you know, you want to come on. But Trevor probably would have come on anyways. But anyways, it just kind of helps because now we can kind of go like, we got it we have credibility within the first week and now we can basically get more guests as a result mm, yeah so it, who is on your like wish list then of people that you want to get Ooh. on that's a hard question because i tried to get doug pinnock on my other podcast for three years or two years however long it's been and i had no fucking luck and then this time just pure fluke saw a call for interviews for him last week and got him um so yeah, he was on the bucket list. I'm just trying to think who else would be someone that I want. I'm not even sure because so far I've been getting pretty much everybody I wanted. So now I'm starting to, I need to actually figure out who we do. <laughs> like seriously, because I'm not really sure because, because there's like so many people we were trying to get and we've gone down the list and now I'm getting to the point where I'm like, I'm not sure who we, who we still want to get. I mean, I'll, I'll have a think and maybe, yeah. yeah send you a list or something anybody you want who's realistic i mean but just keep in mind like we're not at the like cannibal corpse turned us down so we're probably not going to get yeah. someone like m or aim on a marth but reversely we got trevor so i don't know might as well try yeah definitely yeah i kind of yeah you guys definitely got people that i 
didn't expect and like you say I know the connections thing obviously makes a big difference but even so I was kind of this is a small podcast <laughs> yeah well the, the thing is like if you if you have that connection with the person already they're easy to get versus like um we'll go back to like for example we got Sarah on the podcast but the only reason we got Sarah on the podcast is she probably wouldn't have come on our podcast I don't think if we hadn't been working with her yeah you know what I mean and then we yeah. got uh who else did we get Blasco was just because like I said I already had that connection there Michael Sweet was due to having his publicist on my old podcast a year mm -hmm. and a half I already knew the publicist and he had promised me at the time if an opportunity with Michael Sweet ever came up he would give it to me oh, I had that okay. right so I called it <laughs> called in the favor as soon as Michael became available yeah. nice so what's do you have a like a particular episode that was your favorite to do oh that is a difficult question a favorite episode because i liked i don't think there's <clears throat> any that i didn't enjoy doing um but one person that i do always like to have on um, who's probably going to be a bit of a surprise because um, I, th I think that they always have lots of good information to give is Bradley Sorg Drager. Um, he's coming back on again next month. Uh, but he was on my older podcast, I think like nine times. And then he was on uh, this one, I think twice now. So he's going to be three times, but he's always really good to have on. Lindsay's always good to have on. Um, Jan from Walken was really good to have on. Yeah. There's it, it's, hard to say because there's just there's always been so many good guests That's, i was kind of hoping that you wouldn't answer because i thought that might be a bit awkward if you <laughs> well, it is, but, like, just, but yeah it's good people but the one thing one thing reason why i like having bradley on like uh, i'm just going to go back to tooting bradley's horn for a second is because he's someone that's been in journalism for a few years he's written for every major publication and then he somehow managed to get himself into like band marketing and management type stuff for some pretty big people like in a relatively short period of time so he's really really smart and really good at what he does so anytime he comes on I always like to, like I just love to have him on as a result of that plus he's local so I'll have to say yeah. I haven't met him in person I know I keep thinking of people to ask but then it's like the time zone's a bit awkward how are we going to figure that out so we can figure out anything you want Holly I know that's fine because there's quite a few European bands and kind of organizations I think might be good to tap into at some point. Um, Anybody you want, we will do. Cool. I shall get on with writing my list. Cool. Um, so, in all your time in PR, is there like one particular mistake that you see from bands in general that is kind of like, I don't know, the ultimate thing that needs to be fixed? Yeah, mouthing off. Yeah. Mouthing off, uh, being too conceited, um, attitude in general is the main thing. Because if you get a bad attitude and then the other people sense it, no one wants to work with you. Mm -hmm. So you can have super high expectations um, that are beyond what you should have. And if you're just being a dick about it to the publicist or whatever, or you're being a dick about it to your manager, you're just not going to go anywhere. I think that's the biggest mistake. Mm -hmm. Is it, do you think it's like high expectations where it comes from then? I mean, I'm I know not, sometimes people are just idiots, but. Um, you, I mean, I, I mean, some people are idiots, yeah. But I mean, as, as a general rule, um, I think the problem is like some people, like when you come to, if we're talking about PR, I think we have generally as a rule not gotten those high expectations. We did have someone fairly recently that had that. So we did have that problem. Okay. Um, but as a general rule, we don't have that because I always say right up front, and I even put in the contract, we are not guaranteeing you shit. Mm. Like just right off the bat, I'm gonna, I just tell them you are not guaranteed anything. This could go really well. It could fucking bomb. Most of the time we get good results. We'll do our best, but um, I don't know what's going to happen. But that being said, where was I going with this? With the high expectations, I mean, what will happen sometimes, like a band will get in touch with me and they'll be like, we want Krang, we want decibel we want this we want that yeah. and if i lead them on or i make them think that it's possible when i then th there's going to be a problem but if i'm yeah. honest and i tell them like i always do i say i don't know we can try then it works so where it comes from it's hard to say 
Okay, I'm going to flip the question on its head then. What's sure. like the best thing that you've seen bands do? Uh, where they take initiative themselves and they try to back up the campaign um, and help by doing social media and by um, actually talking to journalists and stuff like that. I think that is the best thing the band can do. Um, I think, for example, like with the Disconnected Souls campaign we're doing, we're going to just talk about you for a second. So, I mean, because it's a re-release, we're probably not going to get a ton of reviews or anything like that, but we're still like, it, like I, I don't have high expectations for this campaign. I don't know if you do, but I don't have high, high because it's a, it's a re-release. Yeah. Okay. As long, as long as we're on the same yeah, page. Yeah, I'm on the same page. I'm kind of like, yeah, it'll be all right, but I'm not expecting anything major from it. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not going out and like, you know, being super, super, super push. Right. But I'm doing a push at the same time. Right. So like with something like that, like we kind of both know you know, that's probably not going to be a ton of reviews. There's going to be a bit of press. And we actually had more than I thought mm -hmm. so far. Um, where am I going with this? So when, but when you're going out there and you're on social media and you're talking to people all the time, that helps because now people now are seeing who you are, that type of thing. You doing the podcast and all the rest of that. Mm, definitely. I know that rem they reminds me actually, I was on Twitter earlier and there was a band who hadn't told us their Twitter link. <laughs> Who is that? Oh, don't tell me that. Don't tell me I'm that. Not, I'll tell you later. Um, yeah, and I just kind of like, you know, I'm sharing the press thing and it's like the blog would have tagged them if they'd known. And it, it's only because I thought, I know, I'll just double check Twitter and make sure that they haven't or they have got a profile and of course it comes up. So yeah. just... what, what? that's also our fault too. Yeah, I know. I kind of, I mean, I try and go and check everything, but I don't always have time or... I sometimes just forget about it and I just assume that they've sent us everything because why would they miss something? But, you know. We did the same thing though. So mm. we have done the same thing. Like I know that I myself, um, I've had bands where I couldn't find the Twitter handle or anything like that. I stupidly didn't ask. And then I find out that you did a month later or whenever it is, they have a Twitter handle. I could have been tagging them this whole time, but that's my fault. I, I look at it being my fault because I didn't directly go you have a Twitter handle. Yeah, I know what you mean. Mm. So in other words, it's both of our faults. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yep. Um, okay, keeping with Twitter, because I think a yep. lot of fans seem to have problems with Twitter the most. What sort of, I guess, your best advice for, maybe for getting going on it, because I think a lot of people, fans, they create a profile and then it doesn't seem to go anywhere, so they sort of give up. Well, let me reverse the question to you before I answer. What did you do? I started commenting on everything. <laughs> Bingo! <laughs> just everything. Yeah, just start commenting on everything, and that's really the only way that you can do it, Holly. Just you got to just start commenting, um, you know, and just getting in there and putting your face out there, and just start talking to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's made a noticeable difference in a very short period of time for me. So. Yeah. And you're also um, doing better on your Instagram and you're doing better on your Facebook too, aren't you? Yep. Trying. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you're doing good. Yeah, I know. Facebook annoys me because, I mean, it just annoys me. But anyway. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I guess, yeah, I don't know. Do you have any kind of tips for dealing with the fact that Facebook is just sort of dying at the moment? <laughs> Oh. Um, the best thing you can do on Facebook and the only thing that I've seen that really gets a lot of engagement is if you try to say do something that causes a reaction back as in asking yeah. a question yeah so um, like if you like just looking at you right now I would post something about your cup because your cup's fucking amazing um, I, I then, did I posted it on Instagram yesterday and everyone was commenting on how nice the mug is and I was like it is nice but I didn't think I, anyone would comment on it <laughs> I didn't even see that post and I'm looking at it as we're talking now. Um, but yeah, cause it's, it, it's a pretty freaking awesome mug. I think we almost bought you that as a present one time, or did we buy that as a present? Was that from us? That wasn't from us, was it? No, this was, I've had this for years. <laughs> it's been so okay. long. I think we were thinking about getting you that one time. That's what, but we got you that, yeah. that other thing instead. So that, that's what threw me off there. Um, I'm glad I saw you with that because now I know not, not to ever get you that. <laughs> uh, but anyway, 
you, if you posted something like that, what do you think, or what's your favorite thing on the album, or what do you think about tacos, or what's your favorite kind of mustard or ketchup? Probably nothing mm-hmm. stupid like that, but you could even go that that road if you wanted to. Cool. I'll I'll do that later and be on a social experiment. Coffee or tea? That's what you want to ask. Yeah, I feel as though I ask that question a lot, but then again, it yeah. well, it seems to like get people talking for some reason. <laughs> That's the main thing is whatever you can do to get people talking because you want to get your band in front of people, right? So if you can get people to talk to you, then they'll check out your band eventually and it's always good. So, well, actually, are you a coffee person? Boy. What do you think? <laughs> this long okay so you've known me since i thought uh, you were but i was thinking i got that right i got coffee i'm a coffee nice. is that um and um, is that the inferno dolls mug that is the inferno dolls mug yep oh. i'm eyeing well, up everybody's mugs at the minute um good <laughs> just <laughs> good i don't know why you're eyeing up <laughs> <laughs> Creepy Holly, but okay. Am I really- <laughs> no, I, I've just been going looking at everyone's merch stores because it's interesting seeing what people do. It's like, oh, everyone's got mugs, great. Um, Holly's not a stalker, okay. I'm not. <laughs> She's a stalker with scissors and a fucking mug. <laughs> I'm my coffee if I keep it. Okay, back on track, Holly. You got to keep this interview going here. Oh, <laughs> uh, oh okay. Um. Hmm. What's like the best reaction you've had from a journalist? Oh, that's hard to say. Yeah. Um, the best reaction? I don't know if I can say a best reaction. I don't know what the best reaction would be. That's a tough one, Holly. I, I that's that's a yeah. question I can answer. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. I, I guess is there like a, a favorite type of reaction or something that I don't know, you like to try and get for the bands and stuff. This is what I like to do. So, like, if a journalist will share uh, something from the band, that's what I always like. Most people do not share the link, and bands do the same thing. I don't like it. Um, I think if you get, if you are the writer of the article, you should share it. And I think the person who's written about should always share it. I think the PR should share it as well. Um, and I think anybody associated with the band should be sharing it too, like on all their on all their public pro- or personal profiles, rather. <clears throat> yeah, I know. I kind of because I was doing this earlier. There's a few journalists that I was looking for, and I don't know if I just spelt the name wrongs or uh, couldn't find them or something. But it's kind of like I couldn't find any social media presence for some of them. So obviously, yep. then they're not sharing if they're. Yep. So I don't, I don't know. I just find that a bit strange because I kind of try and share everything that I write. So Yeah, but it depends, right? There are some journalists that aren't on social media. Kevin Stewart Panko, for example, is not on any social media. Oh, um, he's been around for years. Um, so you're never going to get a share out of him, but he writes yeah. everywhere. Um, but reversely, there's a lot of PRs that don't share either. And there's also I a lot of... That. Yeah, I always find that really odd because it's kind of like you're proving that you can do stuff so why are you not sharing it yep yep and i mean our account and i'm not selling, signaling, uh, <laughs> singling you out but our account doesn't even share everything because you're not gonna have time to share everything but i do on all my stuff right yeah i've no i sometimes if i'm trying to figure out what's going on i'll go and look at your accounts and then share it from there onto the c squared because it's just easier for me to keep track of everything <laughs> i noticed that I, I should probably also start tagging c squared as well that's something that i should probably note down to do to start taking because i do that with Aaliyah, and then Aaliyah retweets everything on twitter but mm. yeah most people just don't share the link and i personally I think that's stupid yeah yeah i don't get it um, hmm hmm what's been how do I phrase this? I was going to say what's kind of like the, the worst experience like with a journalist. I don't know, like the mm. worst reaction or type of reaction. Or... I got one of those. I won't name the names, but this was back in 2014. And um, a journalist requested an interview with a, with a band I was working with. Sorry, a one-man black metal band. 
who shall remain nameless, but I now hate this person. And um, this is part of the reason why I do not like working with black metal bands. Um, this journalist worked at uh, the largest music site in the world at the time. And they requested an interview with the guy. And of course, I said, yes, of course. We will definitely accommodate you with us. Uh, you know, it's a one-man black metal band. This guy's never going to get this kind of opportunity. And uh, send the questions over. Label even agreed. They're like, yep, yeah, fuck yeah, let's do this. This is awesome promotion for the album. Love it. Thank you for doing this. So journalist sends the questions over. Black metal man decides he's too good for them. Refuses to do the interview because they're in print publication. And I said to him, and the label did too. Look, you fucking idiot. This is the <laughs> music site in the world at the time. Please do this. This will really help your label to sell some, uh, you know, albums. It had CDs and cassettes to sell. Um, you know, your raw black metal that you're not exactly Mr. Commercial over here. Um, and he said, nope, we'll only do it for a print publication because as far as I'm concerned, web is beneath me. So I had like, we argued with the guy for the next three days, nonstop. And the guy dug his heels in, absolutely refused to do the interview, said, fuck this, I'm not doing this, period. So I had to tell the journalist this and she was pissed. I am not surprised. She was so fucking mad at me. She would not cover any of my bands for like the next year, two years. I, can, I kind of feel that's unfair on you because it wasn't your fault. True, I mean, but I guess, she was mad. And mm. um, yeah, I, I, there was nothing I could do about it. And I was fucking pissed. I didn't want to work for that label ever again. And I didn't want to work for that band. And I, as far as I'm concerned, that band is a piece of shit. And I don't want to have anything to do with them. Are they still going out of interest, you know? I don't know. I've actually forgotten the person's, the band's name. I would have to go look it up. Yeah. I'm going to do that while we're on the phone. So, keep, so while, while you're asking the next question, I am going to see if I can uh, find this individual, if they're, if they're still around. But yeah, I, I was not happy. Uh, is that, have you had that before with people doing a sort of, I don't know, I'm too good for web or like, yeah. yeah. Is it, it just because everyone just wants to be in a print magazine? Is that kind of what it is? Or is it, I don't know. Some people have the stupid idea that print is the only thing that matters, and that's not true. Print is pretty much most, like if you get in a print magazine, you're not going to be seen as much as you are on the web as a general that's, rule. Yeah. Um, print is just an ego thing for people that, that are like my age. I grew up reading magazines. So if you're like in your 40s, it's like, oh, yeah, this is the best thing. But it really doesn't fucking matter most of the time for most people. Like if you score decibel, the people that read decibel buy albums, mm -hmm. right? that's a good thing but at the same time if decibel online wanted to interview you and it wasn't going in decibel print i would say do the interview with decibel online because i believe i believe and i could be mistaken that they get more views per month than the magazine does um where was i going with this so yes i think sometimes bands will just refuse to do interviews because they think um it's beneath them wherever the place that's asking them so that um, usually that doesn't happen so much with our clients anymore but when I was starting out I don't know why but it was just it seemed like that was like a prevalent thing where bands would be like you know I'm too good to do interviews it's not so much anymore but it was was back in like 2014 2015. okay well, yeah that's really interesting mm -hmm. mm. maybe they just didn't I don't know Maybe they had nothing interesting to say and they were worried that no one would find them interesting. I don't know. I don't know. I just think it's stupid. Like to me, if you're if you're if you're gonna pay for a PR campaign and then refuse to do interviews, I'm sorry, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my life. Yeah, I yeah, I don't get that. Okay, let's talk about this for one second and you can get on to your next question. I just need to rant for a brief second. So like this is this is one thing that's always bugged me. And again, it this doesn't happen really anymore, but it used to happen. Uh, when I first started, bands would pay for a PR campaign and then they would bitch and complain if they didn't get, um, like, let's say, let's say, for example, noisy or something like that. Noisy, noisy is one of the largest public or was one of the largest publications in the world for music, um, or the AV club or something like, like that, but just bitch, bitch, bitch about not getting that. 
the thing that most bands don't understand is to get that high of a level when you're an independent band is like such a fluke and it's so rare for it to happen it just blows my mind so like i wouldn't like if you were paying someone like for example 200 bucks to do a pr campaign and you expected to get vice av club and um i don't know decibel magazine back in 2015 it's like dude what are you thinking like i mean it could happen but it's like it's virtually non-existent chances and when you have no label um and for example you're like a thrash metal band that's my rant mm-hmm. and i found who the band was i'll tell you afterwards oh, did you? <laughs> I, did. I was wondering if that was coming <laughs> yeah that was coming that, that's what started the rant right there so. oh, right. <laughs> but i'm ready to move on when you are holly or you can keep digging di- digging <laughs> you, you, you're free to ask me whatever you want okay oh well, well i guess if something that i'm kind of interested in Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I, th- I think I could ask you this. Okay. What's what's kind of your opinion on record labels? Um, I mean, it depends. I mean, like sometimes they're needed, sometimes they're not. I mean, it depends upon the band and what kind of deal they got. Um, I don't think, like for example, you guys need a record label right now. Um, also, I don't. I mean, if a band has nothing to bring to the table, there's no reason for a label to sign them. You know what I mean? Like if they don't have any sales, they can't get anybody to their show or anything like that. Like what, like there's no point in hunting for a label. You know what I mean? Uh, Reversely, like if you're a little band and you get signed to like a big, big label, a lot of times they're not going to push you like they are the big acts. So you might be better off not being on the label. So it it, it all depends. It's really hard to say. Yeah, it's kind of a, I mean, whether we, ever ever go on a label at all is kind of a I don't know me and Fletch went to a um talk thing about labels a while ago and the information they gave us it's kind of like we can do this ourselves you can do a point but yeah. I mean like like if I mean I know there's a the point isn't there when it's kind of a yeah it depends like if you're at a point where you want to go worldwide and you have the sales and you can actually do it it makes sense but if you're not I don't see the point. Yeah. I know one thing that we had that was kind of weird is a load of, like, some really small record labels, some kind of, uh, I don't know, slightly bigger ones, just started sending us random emails. But they're those kind of scouting emails where they're like, submit your stuff to be considered on a record label. And I kind of think, why, why are they sending out those kind of really, I don't know, Money. Well, yeah, I know, but it's just like... Money. There's a well-known, well, there used to be a well-known. I ended up, I had done PR for a couple of their releases before I realized that they were scamolas. Um, mm-hmm. But um, they had, what did they do? They just send out uh, hundreds of emails to anybody that they can find on Bandcamp. And then they tell them every time that they are signed then they want a thousand euros and then they give them 300 CDs promise them a PR campaign that consists of sending one blast to an email list that they own. And, uh, that's it. And then they wow. pocket bucks. Maybe if, uh, I won't ask you to tell me the name of them now, but if you could maybe mention it later, that might be quite interesting. Sure. If you, yeah. They, they, they are a label that are located in Europe is all I'm going to say for right now. And if anybody wants to know the name of the label, feel free to hit me up. Um, I have, like I said, I did a couple of their releases in the past, not really realizing what the scam was. And then once I found out, out. Mm-hmm. Mm. I guess that's kind of another thing. I mean, I know you've, well, you've done all of the How to Avoid Scammers podcasts. Mm-hmm. But is there anything, I don't know, really essential? Or how to avoid a scam, like for PR? Yeah. Okay. So number one thing is overpromising. That's number one thing. So if you get promised a ton of stuff on a PR campaign, um, you should run away as fast as you can. Uh, if Holly tells you that she's going to get you in Kerrang and she's going to get you in Decibel and she's going to get you in Visible Oranges and she's going to get you in Metal Injection, Uh, Let me know because Holly's going to be fired. Um, Holly's going to be fired for that. Uh, But in reality, 
all jokes aside, like if someone's telling you that they're guaranteeing you press, especially at a big publication, um, I would run away. Cause I've had bands tell me that um, such and such a PR guaranteed them coverage at Kerrang for like 200 bucks. It's not true. Mm-hmm. It's just not. Um, then they'll go to that PR and then later they'll find out they were just be- meant that they just had a connection at Kerrang and maybe they could I was, get. Yeah. Maybe- I was going to say, how do they weasel out of it? <laughs> Yeah. So, like, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the main thing right there is over promising. And then also, you should always take a look at their background, um, ask other people that have done campaigns with them. That being said, ask a number of people that have done campaigns with them because everybody's going to have a story of how a PR campaign didn't work. And every PR I know under the sun, moon, and stars has someone that doesn't like the job that they did for them. We ourselves have have someone that is unpleased, even though we got them in uh, some of the biggest publications in the world, and uh, they're they're still infuriated. That I guess they didn't get, I don't know what, but it happens. So mm-hmm. I've heard people call like well-known PRs, like for example, someone tried to tell me that EarSplit was a scam, and I'm like, EarSplit's not a scam. Like that's not true. It's just not fucking true. Someone else, you know, people have tried to tell me stuff like that. Someone like, or Clawhammer is no good, and I'm like, Clawhammer's good PR. I know they're good PRs. You know what I mean? Like there are competition. Mm-hmm. They at the same time, th- these people are not scammers. They're not yeah. scamming money. Um, you know, if a campaign didn't go well, that's not necessarily the PR's fault. Ninety-nine percent of the time, most established PRs are doing the best job that they possibly can, and they're not scamming anybody. Uh, PR campaigns do not always go the way, best way the way that they should. Sometimes they fail, uh, but most people do the best job that they possibly can. So if you hear that a PR is a scam, check it with a few people first there are known scammers out there there are people that routinely do a bad job but for example if someone's been doing like an established pr there's a really good chance that they're probably not a scammer if they've been around that long you know what i mean so Mm -hmm. like i would like especially like a, a a pr that's been around for a while that handles both big and small names if you ever hear that they're a scam artist or something like that 99.9% 99.9% of the time, it's not going to be true. So those are the two things, over-promising and do a background check, but check more than one person because also you might hear that someone got really good results with a PR, but that was like their one success story and they've had yeah. nothing else, right? So anything's possible. Cool. Um... What's your advice for bands who are maybe considered like if they've never done PR before, yeah, um, and they're perhaps trying to decide if they're ready for it, sort of both kind of musically but also maybe financially or things like that. Do you have like any tips for that? This is a very good question, Holly, but uh, because there's a number of factors that could be involved in this. So number one, the question is: Are you at a level or quality level where you actually need PR? Um, there are some PR companies that will take anybody who has money. Yeah. Um, we could even name a couple if you want, but uh, <laughs> like, for, uh, you got like against PR, metal coffee, PR, those type of places. They'll charge you like 50 bucks. They don't even check yeah. your, they just blast it out. Right. I think metal coffee PR is done though. I could be wrong on that. Um, but anyways, you got people like that. They'll just blast your music out and they won't even check it so yeah. oh yeah i had someone actually who went to them first and then came to me that happens to me all the time too i had some i've had <laughs> people go like well you cost 1200 bucks he's charging me 50 i'm gonna go with them okay go for it see what happens tell, tell me how it goes because i'm very interested and every single time it's like not worth it it wasn't even worth the 50 bucks i paid okay i told you but that's how it goes. Um, like one thing people got to realize is like when you're doing PR, if it's too low, that's a warning signal. If it's too high, that's also a warning signal. So you kind of want to, there's like kind of like a happy medium you want to kind of go for where it's not like too low and it's not too high. It's like going to the dollar store. If you buy macaroni and cheese at the dollar store, it's going to be a lot less quality than buying it a different high like macaroni and cheese is a lousy example because like it's so <laughs> it's hard to fuck up. the dollar store version you can fuck up pretty bad like it's really bad right <laughs> so if you buy like 
dollar version mac and cheese versus like the craft dinner mac and cheese, which is also horrible. The dollar <laughs> really, that was a lousy example, but anyway, I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm not comparing PR to craft dinner. So I'm just saying, like if you go too cheap, it's probably not going to be very good unless the person's new and starting out and trying to and trying to build a client base. It would make sense, but if they're too cheap and they're offering you PR for twenty five bucks for six months or something stupid like that, there's it's not going to be worth your time. And other warning signals. What other warning signals do I got? So over promising. Um, are we still on that question, or did I skip? Did I skip a question? Uh, yeah, it was kind of what was it? Like What's advice a, to funds who've never done yeah. PR before. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so yeah, quality. Uh, check to make sure your quality is good. Uh, check to make sure you're not paying too much or too little. Uh, if you go to a high price PR and you're a new band. Um, one problem is that some of these people that work with the bigger bands aren't used to working with smaller bands anymore so they can't break smaller bands they're only used to working with the bigger bands now so you want to keep that in mind too because that can happen not a, not every pr is like that that works big bands but a lot of them are but some of them are so yeah so make sure you go with with a pr that suits you i guess is what i'm trying to say that was a very roundabout way of giving you the <laughs> very roundabout way. have you have you ever had problems actually of people like coming to you who are completely the wrong, uh, wrong genre yeah yeah i find yeah. this i find this hilarious yeah we had someone about three weeks ago uh four weeks ago three weeks ago who actually reached out on the instagram my instagram or i'm sorry my email uh they said i wanted to get they said they wanted to get the three month tier one package um and they said how do i pay you and i was like i don't even know who you are i don't know what your music sounds like i know nothing about you can you kind of send me some information and i can tell you whether we're interested in working with you or not and he wrote back all surprised he was like oh well here's my music music was pop like really mellow pop music super mellow pop music and i message the guy and I'm like um we don't deal with this type of music in any way shape or form and he seemed all surprised and I said did you research us first and he's like oh yeah and I was like did you not notice that we don't handle super mellow stuff and he's like no I didn't notice that I just thought you guys sounded like you'd be a good company and I was like, whatever so it does happen sometimes uh but reversely at the same time um we do have like c squared can handle more than just metal or hard rock we have done a lot of goth um we can handle i have done like dark folk i did karate for example last year i don't know if you know who she is um but i did hers um then we did Lindsay's harp album last year for example so we can handle other things but we do best with the metal with the more hard rock metal stuff mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would have thought that'd be fairly obvious with us sharing all the metal bands, but may, maybe not. <laughs> People are weird sometimes, that's all I gotta say, Holly. I don't understand. Yeah. That. Yeah, that's true. Oh well, who's the weirdest? Well, I don't know, are you allowed to answer that? <laughs> who's the what? weirdest person you've worked with? <laughs> the weirdest I've worked with. Oh, uh, the weirdest person I've worked with, uh, probably everybody at C squared, I would probably say would be the <laughs> people I've worked with to date. Um, if I'm going to be completely honest. So at a yeah. client, I don't know if I want to say for clients, but no, in, no, that's probably funny. five, four, five, how many of there? Six. I don't even know how many people there are anymore. Six. Seven? <laughs> just, yeah. All of you guys with the exception of, no, actually he's weird too. <laughs> I was going to say with the exception of Sam, and I was like, no, Sam's actually weird. Yeah. So, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in order of weirdness, I don't really want to rank you guys, but um, I'd say I'm going to, I'm going to say you guys. Well, that's fine. I mean, I feel as though we're all kind of weird in different ways. So, I don't know if he can rank us. Uh, I, I got an idea of. You have ranked, ranked us, haven't you? <laughs> I'm not going to say who, who's who right, on, right live. Anyway, I'll tell you off screen who okay. I can, but. I think me and Corey would be at the top, followed by, I don't know, it's hard. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say. 
I mean, I'll be slightly offended if I'm not near the top, to be honest. But... Well, hard to say some days. Yeah. Some days. I mean, you, you've got the established degrees and stuff like that, so I don't know if you're necessarily the weirdest every time, but you are weird. I mean, I, if you've ever been a, in a room full of academics, they're, they're not never, normal. I would never want to be in a room full of academics. Never as it, long it's as... It's an I'm experience. <laughs> Probably rather slip my wrist than have to sit oh. in <laughs> academic. You do you do realize I am a high school dropout, right? You didn't realize that, did you? I don't think I knew that actually. I, I think I thought I told you that right off the bat because well, I, I thought maybe you did mention I, I I think think I did because I was like, she's got like twenty degrees. Is she really going to want to work? Let's drop out of high school. Or do you just decide it wasn't for you anymore? Or you want to hear the story about how I dropped out? Yes, please. We can have this on the podcast here. I don't mind. It's stupid. <laughs> it Only if you stupid. want to. <laughs> I don't mind. Like, whatever. It was the stupidest story. So in grade 10, I think it was, um, I always got pretty good grades. Just, I want to say that. I, I The only reason, the only re, um I did fail a grade, but the only reason I failed a grade is because I never went to school. I sat at home and I drank and I smoked weed. I was not, I was a bit of an idiot back in grade 10, but I got good grades when I showed up. Um, so I, the English teacher, had us reading Animal Farm. And I liked the book Animal Farm. I'd read the book Animal Farm previously. I was probably the only person in class that ever read Animal Farm. I think I read it when I was like nine years old. And I think I read it again when I was like 13. That's quite young to be. I mean, it was, yeah, well, it was on our books. Like I always used to read a lot. So um, it was on our bookshelf. It was small. It said Animal Farm. I was like, I'll just check it out, whatever. And I read <laughs> I liked it. I didn't. I didn't really get the political ramifications of it at the time. I still don't know it fully, but I, I got the gist of it. You know. Um, so we were reading Animal Farm, and I was like, "Cool, this should be easy for me to do because I've already read the book twice." So we're doing Animal Farm, and then we get to the end of I think it was chapter one or something like that, and the teacher, the English teacher, gave us told us that we had to write a report on the parallels between what we just read, and it was like communist russia or whatever the hell it is and i'm like we weren't taught this like he just had us read the chapter we weren't taught this like and i was like so i was like okay you know um i'm not really clear what's going on here we haven't read anything about the soviets you know or the communists or whatever it is i don't really understand what's going on i have no idea what to tell you about this but i can tell you about the book and he said no you gotta you gotta do a detailed report i think it was like 500 words on the allegories with the russians and i was like but i've never read this before and you haven't told us anything about this and he said well too bad you got to do it go to the library and figure it out and i just like fuck you i quit i mean he the, yeah that teacher sounds like an asshole oh he was a bit of an asshole but i but i was also a day like quitting over something stupid like that yeah silly at the same time right so i was like yeah i'm done see you later i'll go work and since then i've worked 24 7 but I didn't quit because I was dumb. I quit because I was an asshole and I was stubborn. Yeah. <laughs> Big difference. Yeah. Huge difference. But the funny part was, the funny part was, just to toot my own horn for a second here, I was probably the only person in that class that could actually read the entirety of Animal Farm and under, actually understand what was going on. And I, the thing that pissed me off with it was like, we weren't taught it. So I didn't want to go back, copy something out of a fucking history book. So I was yeah. mad. No, I, I get that. Mm. So yeah, so that so that's so that's my story of dropping out of high school. I'm surprised you asked me that question. That's hilarious. No, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't, it wasn't the answer I was expecting. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody always expects something good, and it's always like, no, I dropped out of school because I didn't want to fucking do a report on Animal Farm. Uh, I, I'm just interested that it's literature related. Well, I would, I, I would like, I would have liked the, like to discuss the aspects of the literature aspect of it versus the historical aspect. If I was in, if, if this was the social studies class, I probably would have been like, yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll go do what you tell me. But because it was the English class, rightly or wrongly, I said, go fuck yourself. Mm. Yeah, that's fine. You know, you've just reminded me of an exam mm. because I had an exam on Animal Farm. Yeah. And what it was is they'd prepared us for the three main characters that the exam board always asked on. So, of course, typically in the exam, they asked us on a fourth one that we'd never been prepared about. Yep. And I kind of 
didn't do great <laughs> because of it. Sorry. Goddamn Animal Farm. Animal Farm's like the the cause of both of our failures, Holly. <laughs> it's fine I still I eventually got where I wanted to go so it's fine but at the time it was just like I failed not because I'm incapable but because someone else was incapable thanks yep yeah. yeah. we'll blame everyone else instead of ourselves <laughs> I'm kidding at least you have a sense um, of you. I yeah you have to I think so we got about five to ten minutes left what do you want to, what do you want to what do you want to they told me about my uh, schooling. <laughs> uh, mm, I don't know. Um, you, it, it's, it, you can ask me any hot button topic you want. I don't care. I'll answer anything. 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 Hmm. I don't know. Do you play computer games? What's your favorite computer game? Um, I. Did. I haven't in months since we started C Square because I'm working yeah. on. But um, the one that I really liked, oh, what's the name of it? It's uh, frick, names on the tip of my tongue. It's got the it's got the uh, kid in the yellow uh, yellow suit. What the frick is it called? Little Nightmares. Oh, Little oh, Nightmares. I love that. Yeah, it's a fun game. Yeah, uh, that was. I think that was the last one I uh, completed before we went on our C Square media. Ah. I love that game. That was t lots and lots and lots of fun. I was even had downloaded the second one, I think, uh, but I never ended up playing it. Uh, yeah, I've never done the second one. Yeah, but mm. I love that game. It was super hard at times. I had to look at walkthroughs, but I did complete it. Yeah, yeah. I usually end up looking at walkthroughs <laughs> at some mm -hmm. point. <laughs> yeah, mainly out of frustration. I got to that point on uh, one of the puzzles and I was just like, fuck this, I gotta look. And then I just, yeah. Mm. Cool. She's thinking. I'm, <laughs> I am thinking. <laughs> I will be, next time I'll be more prepared rather than, hey, Holly, you're interviewing me five well, minutes before the fuck. <laughs> Because since, since you kind of said it and you kind of phrase it as a question, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say that. Do you know why I do that to you? Um, because you're trying to push me. Yeah, that's about it. Sometimes <laughs> it's a test. Everything I do is a fucking test. Yeah, I I, I kind of appreciate. No, I mostly appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, if you, yeah, but I, I mean, like like the way I look at it is like if you can stand up to the bullshit I throw at you. You can fucking handle anything. So, like, if I tell you, like, you got to go, come on and you got to interview me or you got to interview, uh, who was it that we made you interview two weeks ago? Liam. We made, who was it? Oh, well, you made me lead when we were last on with Liam. Yeah, and you didn't know it was happening until, like, 15, 20 minutes beforehand or whatever. Yeah, that's true. So, <laughs> but you did, you did a great job. And uh, I think it just helps you just think on your feet. You might, hate me for it. you might hate me for it when I'm doing it. <laughs> but at the same time, I think I think it's good. That's good. Cool. Um, hmm. Hmm, okay. I, I'm, my brain's going to like three different questions, and I'm thinking which one do I choose? I got like five minutes. That's something like that. Okay. What's your favorite board game? <laughs> board game i haven't played a board game in years holly um i'm trying to think what would have been my favorite board game i'm going to say monopoly even though i don't know if that really is my favorite board game but i'm going to say monopoly anyways mm -hmm. i used to like clue not clue risk rather when i was when i was little too i like yeah. playing um, xbox version of risk too so risk what are you going to say nice. yeah don't play monopoly against fletch if he ever offers because he what? always wins and it's really annoying is he one of those dickheads that'll just try to take everything basically yeah <laughs> fuck him yeah don't do that um do you have a favorite an all-time favorite album album i do kind of i mean i got a few um mm. and you're probably gonna laugh at me for saying this but well, I mean, I got two. Which one do I want to say for first? They're totally opposite ends of the spectrum. Two. Oh, okay. So one of them is um, Too Fast for Love by Motley Crue. 
do you love that one? Okay. And then the opposite end is Boys for Pele by Tori Amos. Okay. Two opposite. I quite, I quite like that though. I like that they're opposites. That's cool. Yeah. But I mean, um, yeah, both of those two are probably my favorite. But I mean, some it depends upon the day. But generally, as a general rule, I will tell you that those are my two favorite albums. Interesting. Yeah. And completely opposite. What are yours, Holly? Probably. Mm, probably. Um, what's it called? Black Holes and Revelations by Muse. I've never heard that. I will have to check it out. Once it is. A, yeah, it's probably one of the. I mean, I've always liked Muse and I kind of grew up listening to them. Um because Matt Bellamy was kind of the guy that I was like, oh, he's a guitarist, but he's doing stuff that's different. I want to do that. Um, I've pulled it up for once we get off the call. Uh, I'll be interested to know what you think. I'm probably going to be like, this sucks, Ollie. Probably. <laughs> probably won't say that. We'll, we'll, we'll see. I, I don't know. I, I have never heard Muse before, so I, I have Really? No You've never heard them before? If, if, if I have, I'm not I'm not aware that I have. Yeah, I, I probably have, but just not realized I've heard them. They're probably one of those okay. bands hear it and i'll be like oh yeah i know who this is but okay well maybe after you if you get a chance after you listen to this one then go and listen to the latest one because that is very very different <laughs> so i'd be interested to see what you think holes and revelations i would start off with that one because that's more yeah more what they used to sound like done and then i'll message you in like, at like 11 o'clock your time or 12 o'clock your time and be like this sucks or this is awesome nice so you, got a, you got a final question. Give me a final question. Uh, okay. Make it good. Where do you want C squared to be by? I'm going to say January because that's not much time. <laughs> Where do I want it to be in terms of? I kind of functioning as a company. Well. I like it how it is now, but I would like to have it where you guys are all full time and you guys can all do it. I mean, you're technically are full time, but um, where you guys are making enough to be full time um, and we got enough clients that that would work out for all all of you guys. That that would be ideal to me. Um, I don't think Aaliyah really want, is uh, Pat can quit her job right now, but I mean, everybody else pretty much can as far as I know um yeah that's what i would want all you guys full-time able to do it full-time uh gaia should wouldn't have to be doing gaia and you rather wouldn't have to be doing um you know 60 hours a week or anything like that but you can actually work on your music at the same time yeah. you know have this as your day job but you're also doing music full-time uh corey same thing well corey's not in music but you know what i mean um yeah, I mean, just basically so that way everybody, all you guys can be doing it full time like I am and uh, able to um, work on your music at the same time. That to yeah, me would be really cool. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, um, obviously, I mean, I, I don't really give a crap if like you guys, like, obviously be, you guys would have to have enough money to live off of and stuff like that, me too and everybody else. But if you guys could have a full time job and be able to like full time in the music industry, that to me is ideal. Mm. And you not being a teacher, but you do being a publicist full time, that's also what I would like, even though I know you want to be a teacher. <laughs> or not a teacher, a lecturer, rather, or whatever the hell it is that you call. I, I, yeah, I've not done any teaching or anything, whether I, I will or not, I don't know. I keep I calling might go you a lecture. Well, I don't. I, well, I would. I would. I would rather have you be doing your lecturing on music if we could, and stuff like that. Yeah. That's, well, I mean, that's what I'd rather do. I'd rather lecture on music and stuff. So your parents would probably be mad because of the fact they probably paid like a zillion dollars for you to get like twenty degrees. But no, because there, there's this thing um, called a student loan. <laughs> you still got to. Well, yeah, yeah, it's a gray <laughs> area. It's oh, you... <laughs> okay. Well, if you don't have to pay it, I don't give a fuck. It, it's kind of the way it works in the UK is kind of after like 30 years, mm -hmm. whatever you've got left is written off. Oh, so you just don't pay it for 30 years? Is that how it works? <laughs> yeah, really? That's well, it depends. Like, it's kind of once you start earning a certain amount, then they start taking 
uh, like a percentage and so the more you earn the more you pay back um but even so after 30 years whether you've paid it back or not written off nice okay so you could you could technically do that without your parents killing you yeah okay well that's <laughs> i would like to be in january uh holly holly can still be finishing her phd she wants to be called dr holly but i i, I would like for her to be other than that full-time doing <laughs> music and uh, c squared that is cool. hopefully that aligns with you because if it doesn't align with you that's very awkward and very strange yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Okay, good. So is that your final question? Or do you have a final, final question? Um, I think for now, that's my final question. Cool. So how, what are we going to do for the outro, Holly? Um, I don't know. <laughs> There's the outro. We just did it. <laughs>